Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who supports the show on Patreon. Your contributions help to make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at podcastinit.com slash Linode and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your app. And now you can deliver your work to your users even faster with the newly upgraded 200 gigabit network in all of their data centers. If you're tired of cobbling together your deployment pipeline, then it's time to try out GoCD, the open source continuous delivery platform built by the people at ThoughtWorks who wrote the book about it. With GoCD, you get complete visibility into the life cycle of your software from one location. To download it now, go to podcastinit.com slash GoCD. Professional support and enterprise plugins are available for added peace of mind. You can visit the site at podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, and read the show notes. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, I would love to hear them. You can reach me on Twitter at podcastinit or email me at hosts at podcastinit.com. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music, tell your friends and coworkers, and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Blaj Zupan and Yanez Demshar about Orange, a toolbox for interactive machine learning and data visualization in Python. Yanez, could you start by introducing yourself? I'm Yanez Demshar. I'm a professor at University of Ljubljana. I started with AI and um, machine learning. Um, now I'm mostly working with um, students in first year, teach them basic programming in Python, and with children, um, so that's my second second hobby. I'm teaching children um, about computational thinking, programming, using microcontrollers, stuff like this. And Blaj, how about you? I'm also with uh, University of Ljubljana and uh, also with Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I do data mining and machine learning, and uh, I also teach uh, here at uh, university, but also we make a lot of courses for uh, people outside universities, like in companies and uh, high schools and so on. So we like to teach. Uh, I'm lately all on Orange, so I completely spent all my time in uh, on Orange development and everything around it. And Yanez, do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? Yeah, it was actually related to Orange. Orange at that time was um, a collection of C++ classes. I started writing them as as a student, I guess, and nobody could use them. There was no documentation. So it was just a library of of C++ classes. And so I packed them into kind of command line utilities, which had larger and larger number of options. You may think that FFmpeg is a complicated program, but Orange had really complicated command lines. And at a certain point, we, together with Blush, we decided we have to um, invent a language um, in which you could program processes in machine learning. And so somebody told me about Python. And I admired it as a glue language, essentially. So it was way before NumPy and, and before Cython. So if you wanted to do something quick in Python, you had to do, you had to write the slow part in C++. There was no way around it at that time, I guess. So I used Python mostly as a glue language. I didn't appreciate how nice the language is by itself. So that was my first introduction to Python. And Blaj, do you remember how you got introduced to Python? There would be a simple question. Yanis pushed me, um, uh, but the, a more complicated question. I think uh, we were we were actually visiting uh, Baylor College in Houston, and uh, we actually there, there was a there was a sh- there was a bookstore just close to our hotel, and we went there, and we bought two books on Python uh, on Friday, and then uh, we were thinking what to do with it, and Yana started to program, and actually he made a interface uh, from his C++ machine learning routines in Python, and I think this was the start, and it was somewhere around ninety eight or ninety nine, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and. Um... Uh, the story is interesting because we bought two out of three books they had about Python. They had just three. And I guess this was Barnes & Noble, a, a huge bookstore. They had just three books about Python at that time. Now compare it to what you have today. Yeah, there's definitely quite the catalog of books about Python at this point, spanning every discipline that you could imagine. And you mentioned briefly that Orange has had a very long history, but I'm wondering if you can just take some time to describe what the project is and what was your motivation for building it. 
So I still need to dig into a bit of history. I think in 1997, I met uh, Donald Mickey and he visited the institute I was employed in. Donald Mickey is one of the like founders of artificial intelligence. And uh, we talked about how it would be great to have something in machine, something for machine learning, like what R does, but it should be on a web. It should have fancy interface. It should have visualization. And then Donald Mickey and uh, myself and Nadal Arash, we organized a meeting in Blit, which is, by the way, a beautiful uh, resort in Slovenia, a lake resort. Uh, and there were some really great names coming, like Ross Quinlan and uh, Tom Mick- Mitchell, so uh, both of them founders of machine learning. And it was interesting that, so the meeting was about building a tool for machine learning. That was in 1997. Also invited were, was IBM because we thought that Java would be the, the program. And then it was interesting and nothing came out of the meeting. Uh, so I think the, the error was that only the seniors were there and Janes and myself were the only juniors actually. And then Janes walked into uh, my office um, like um, two weeks later and he said, well, we should just do it, right? And this is how it started. Uh, uh, so the motivation was actually to have, a, at that time, a library, uh, sort of like a Swiss knife for machine learning. Uh, and we haven't thought about interface, we haven't thought about uh, uh, visualization, just plain, simple library that would be very simple to use. And given how long the project has been around for, what have been some of the challenges of evolving it as new technologies and new machine learning techniques have evolved and been introduced? So at a certain point, we stopped developing our own algorithms uh, and implementing them. Instead, we just used what's in Scikit and other libraries, and we concentrated more on visualization aspects. So we want to have algorithms that can give you a nice visualizations of patterns uh, in your data. So that's what changed. Also, we don't go much into like deep neural networks and those methods that cannot give you uh, any real insight in your data. They can give you just predictions. Uh, They're good for some things, of course. They're uh, what moves AI now. But we're not really in this business a lot. And who is the target audience for Orange? Yeah, the beginning, actually, the target audience were researchers in machine learning because we were, you know, researchers. And actually, not just researchers, but educators, because we also taught, uh, I mean, we still teach machine learning and uh, data science. And uh, we assumed that uh, uh, the audience uh, enjoyed programming and would learn Python and Orange easily, right? But, but, but then, actually, in around 2000, we worked with uh, medical doctors and mined data from clinical medicine. And we noticed there was little excitement. You know, if I would have a physician and I would say, wow, well, you know, my classification accuracy is 0.7 or my area under ROC curve is uh, cross-validated is 0.9, right? There will be no excitement about that. Uh, even if we show them how the, the classification trees or uh, coefficients in logistic regression look like, there will be no excitement at all. Uh, and then we figured out at that time what they really wanted to see is uh, they would like to visualize the data. They would like to talk with us, but through visualization of data, models, uh, interactions. Uh, For instance, in 2000, there was no tool that uh, you could show a classification tree and then they would say, oh, show me the particular branch. Where, what are the patients that are in this particular branch, right? You would need to go uh, into program and you would need to script. um, And this is not what we wanted. And we actually figured out that uh, visual interactions are so so more powerful. That means visualizations. And then not only visualizations of the data, but something that you can you can browse and touch and uh, select and then mine further. And that goes actually back in 1993. I had a class uh, in uh, high performance computing with uh, a tool called Data Explorer, IBM tools. Uh, something similar was also by Silicon Graphics, uh, and it used uh, visual programming. Visual programming was like you could. You could design the workflow, how you would analyze an image and how you would uh, actually construct an image uh, um, and, and then change the parameters easily and so on. This was fantastic. In 1993, this tool existed. That doesn't exist anymore. And then in 2003, we said, okay, that's the way, that's the proper way to address it. So we need a visual programming framework uh, where you construct data analysis workflows uh, 
very easily just by putting the blocks together. We call them widgets. And we need a heavy visualization. Heavy means that everything needs to be visualized, not only data, but the models. And we need interaction. So in any kind of visualization, you can touch any element and then you can find out what particular data is actually associated with that. So, so that means, right, that our audience changed from machine learning researchers and uh, teachers and university students to just about anybody that has data. And you mentioned that there's a strong focus on the graphical capabilities of Orange. So I'm wondering how that interface is implemented and the kinds of workflows that can be built with the different components and widgets that you have in the library. So technically, we use PyQt, which is a great interface, to great tool for making GUIs. And what the user can do, he can put components of this workflow, like I'm reading the data, I'm showing a data table, I'm showing a scatter plot. Now, the data points I select in the scatter plot should go into, I don't know, clustering. Um, I'm going to use k-means with such and such parameters to choose the, the optimal k, and the clustering how should go into the, those and those widgets. So the user can compose a schema like this, which is essentially programming, except that it that you don't write any code like like textual code. So it's much easier for new users who don't know maybe who don't know any programming and also who may not know much about data analysis because it, because it's so intuitive. It's like a like a child playing with with Lego toy, Lego bricks, just putting stuff together and and the user sees what what works and what what doesn't. So. That, that's the way you use Orange. So what are some of the most notable or interesting widgets and capabilities that you have in the current incarnation of the catalog for the project? Um, although there are many, and some of them are like, uh, I mean, some of them are fancy in, uh, interactions like uh, like clustering and uh, Disney and so on. I really like a very simple one, and this is called the paint data widget. Uh, it's, a, it's a widget where I can paint the data. I can take a brush or a pen, and I can paint two-dimensional data. And that works beautifully uh, when, I, when we teach machine learning. So I can paint the data for, uh, to show that uh, linear regression with polynomial expansion overfits. Uh, I can paint the data for, uh, for clustering. Um, I can... Um, show what is like the uh, regularization. Uh, I can show actually uh, how to trick uh, k-means such that it doesn't guess the right clusters, or maybe that it does, right? Uh, so I like that widget a lot, uh, but it's it really shines in combination with the other ones, right? So I would, I, I would have several windows open in one, I would paint the data in the other one, I would show the results of the clustering, and that would all happen instantaneously. Yeah, so I have yeah. another one. I thought that I thought that Jan is gonna mention nomograms uh, or something uh, here. Janes. I don't have a favorite widget, so I, I, I cannot. So my view of widgets is is so different. I I implemented lots of them. So my favorite widgets are those with the with the nicest code, and users don't see it. But um, that's what. What drives me? Uh, so we have a we have a different driver with Yannis. He he's more on the code side, and I'm I'm on a presentation layer actually, which is great. Uh, working with somebody that's not completely uh, a clone <laughs> of yourself is uh, really complementary and great. So maybe I mention another one. Can I? Sure. Yeah. So lately we are playing with image analytics, and this is one that I enjoy uh, a lot because it's uh, it's so simple. So the the idea is that. Uh, there's a there's a reader uh, for images. So you have images in some folder on your desktop or wherever. You load the images, and there is another widget called uh, uh, called Image Embedder. So that pushes the images through the deep neural network, uh, and then each image is described with a vector. Uh, so the penultimal layer of the neural network, and then you can do things like uh, classification or clustering. So you can cluster the images. Uh, and then you, there's another widget called uh, image, uh, image Viewer. So you would actually go from reading the images, uh, embedding them in a vector space, clustering them, and then you can type on the branches of the cluster and then you see uh, which images are similar to each other. And that works really great. So thanks for uh, the developments in deep learning, of course. And Yanez, are there any widgets that you're particularly proud of the implementation that you'd like to call out? So what I like is in PyQt, you have this model view 
um, paradigm. And I think that our widgets, um, at least those the new ones and those that we renovate, the factor, really um, make use of this paradigm a lot. Um, we implemented a layer on top of, of Qt, which helps us develop widgets quickly. So we don't just add Qt components uh, in, like, like you would do it usually. We call a function which adds the component, but then also uh, synchronizes what's in the component, like a combo box. It's synchronized with an attribute in a certain Python class that represents the widget. So in this way, we have very little overhead to maintain the user interface. So widgets can be really small because of this extra layer. So the, um, those widgets that I, that I really like are the new widgets that use this model view paradigm, and they can be much easier to maintain. We can we can um, add new features quite quickly in this way. Janis is also kind of often very modest about uh, the framework that uh, he has helped to create. So what I would like to expose: if you write a new widget, uh, widget meaning that. Uh, uh, there's a component that uh, gets, let's say, some data and does something like uh, build a neural network and then output something, in this case, the, the classifier. It's very simple to, to build it. So Orange comes with a, so the, the library for, for development comes with a, a, the li the library of uh, different, uh, different controls that you can use. And these controls uh, you can set such that uh, they would uh, Initialize so that they would uh, they would be uh, they would they would use the they would set themselves based on the data on the input right so so every time the data would change to that widget the widget would know how what was the latest setting with the particular data set so so I think this is a really nice piece of code that is uh, digged into Orange but it helps you to actually define the the user interfaces in a in a very simple way. Uh, and such that everything uh, works nicely, so that uh, the settings uh, are uh, are data dependent. That uh, Orange, when you save the workflow, saves these settings. When you open the workflow, the settings are back again. So it helps a lot to reproducibility uh, of the uh, of the data analysis. Right, every data analysis, any every, any workflow that you store is going to behave exactly the same way when you open it again. So essentially, if you have an, a new uh, machine learning algorithm that you implemented or a new visualization method, whatever, if, if you have it in Python or in C++ and you call it through some interface, um, it's really easy to add a new widget to Orange. So anybody can just add a new add-on package to PyPy, pack his methods in like um, maybe 10 or 20 lines of code. You can add a new widget with, with your method and and push it as an add-on to Orange. And for the data interchange between the different stages of the visual flow, how do you manage sending the data from the outputs of one step to the inputs of the other in a way that is as efficient as possible? Uh, yeah, so each widget declares what are its uh, outputs. So it's a name of an output and a type, and other widgets declare inputs. And so there's a piece of orange called signal manager. Uh, if you connect the widgets, they're just gonna send the data object from one widget to another. Most of data types, so most of most signals are just uh, NumPy tables, NumPy arrays. So it doesn't, doesn't involve any, any overhead. So all processing that happens, if, if widget needs to do something with a table or uh, construct a new table, it's in the widget. But this communication is really um, nothing, no processing, no, no memory gets consumed there. This is, it's nice because this decouples uh, uh, the complexity of data analysis. So when you develop Orange, you don't develop Orange, you're actually thinking only about the widget, right? You're thinking, okay, what is this component going to work on and what it's gonna, what's going to output and how uh, it's going to present uh, the information from the input, uh, like in any kind of visualization. So you can develop a widget completely independently of everything else. And then uh, for me, uh, still it's shocking when I use uh, Orange, it's shocking about all the possible combinations where I can use something that uh, was developed maybe half a year ago and then the combination would be uh, completely new, right? I would use something in a completely different way than it was supposed to. Like, uh, for instance, we build a, we build a Silhouette widget uh, for uh, trying to 
score uh, score data instances on how well do, do they fit a particular cluster, right? And then we found out that this widget is actually excellent to find the outliers. And when you're working with a visual language that is an abstraction of a textual oriented language that's fully Turing complete, there are often going to be cases where you bump up against the limitations of what can be represented in the widget. So I'm wondering, what are those limitations that are present in the graphical interface? And what options do users have when they reach those limits in order to be able to take work that they're doing and extend it beyond what they can do within Orange? Yeah, there's a separation. What you can do in visual languages like Orange, like workflows, and what you can do in the code. So one thing that we don't have and probably never will have is loops. Any loop that happens, happens in the widget. You can, you don't, we don't have loops in the workflows. We have been exploring this a lot and people are asking for it, but it just doesn't, doesn't fit our paradigm. Um, of course, you have languages with loops. For, for children, you have Scratch, which, is, which includes loops, of course. But in this workflow paradigm, we just cannot cannot make it work. There is no uh, obvious way to do it. So we, we try to avoid uh, making things incomprehensible by just adding loops. And also, we don't need it. So when the user needs to do something, something really complicated, he has to go to code. Eventually, uh, when the analysis becomes too too complex, um, you, you have to do some coding. There was a design decision in Orange uh, not to have too many widgets. So widget again are components uh, that process the data information. And the idea was not to have too many of them, right? So if you would have loops, then you would have to have some data progress, pre-processing, post-processing and everything. So we do not have that. We do not have a widget that uh, changes a string to something else because that would be too low, right? So we, we rather have uh, as few widgets as possible but there's a, there's a threshold, right? So it should not be too complex uh, again, right? So the complexity meaning that it would have too many options, it, it would do too many different things, right? So we try to, we, we try to leverage this uh, complexity on one side uh, and the number of uh, different widgets on the other side. The problem with too many widgets would be that uh, users wouldn't know actually what to use. If you have a library of thousands of widgets, that, uh, adds a complexity layer that we would like to avoid. So uh, I have seen tools that are kind of similar to Orange, but in which signals could also be not just a whole data tables, but a single integers or strings. Uh, and it became more or less like your coding. So it was too low level to be useful for ordinary users. So we try to stay above this. And if you want to say um, widgets to communicate with, with um, low level data, you're just not supporting it. It's um, it's not our our game. And we've you've mentioned a bit about some of the underlying libraries that you use to build Orange itself and the widget catalog. I'm wondering if you can spend some more time talking about how widget is implemented at a low level and how that implementation has changed over the different versions that you've released. Okay, so we started... Uh, I think we had the very first version was in Tickle TK, but we stopped using it quite soon. It just didn't look nice. So we decided early on to use PyQt, and we are still quite happy with it. The real problem is with uh, visualization libraries like scatter plots and box plot and stuff like this. They're just, we haven't found any good tools for this. So Mat Matplotlib is great, but it doesn't play well with uh, Qt and with interactivity. You just cannot really interact with it. With it. So there was, no, currently we use PyQt graph. We're not too happy with it. We're going for some JavaScript Im embedding uh, into widgets. Um, we just cannot find anything that plays well with uh, PyQt. So that's a big problem we have. Otherwise, we are relying on NumPy, SciPy, um, Scikit-learn for um, machine learning stuff. So that's these are the, the, the two big groups of libraries. One is for visualization and the other is for machine learning. Otherwise, we have like uh, dozens of, of different small libraries also included. And for people who are just getting started with doing data analysis and machine learning, there are a lot of concepts to be able to tackle and understand. So I'm wondering, what are some of the most common difficulties that you've seen when those users are first getting started in that area? And how does Orange help to overcome those gaps in understanding? 
So I think there are three approaches to learn about machine learning. One goes through mathematics, which is obviously okay if you're um, good in mathematics. The other can be through programming. Um, again, you need to be computer science major for this. And the other is more intuitive. You learn through observing things, through, as Blash said, painting some data and seeing how clustering works there and which machine learning method works there. So if you take this route, for instance, you're not computer science or mathematics major, you're uh, coming from, I don't know, biology, then Orange would help you to learn about data mining in more intuitive, um, uh, human-friendly way. I think for me, the challenge is, suppose, so, so you go, um, you say you're in Boston, right? Suppose you, you go on the street in Boston and pick up three random people, right? You stop three random people and say, and you have uh, one hour to teach them what machine learning is. And for me, the challenge is that, can I have a tool actually where within one hour, I would show them what machine learning is such that when they go home, they can they can do it on their own, right? And this is some of the some of the things that we do in Orange is just for supporting this kind of training. Can maybe not in one hour. So uh, we are recently we recently are having a lot of uh, hands-on workshops uh, that take one day, right? Uh, and in one day, I think you can teach people what is machine learning, what is classification, what is clustering. What is the problem with overfitting? We even go into regularization, right? And Orange is really a tool where you can do that. You, you can actually train people within, within a day or maybe two uh, such that they become aware of what is possible to do. I'm not saying that uh, they become data scientists because for data scientists, you, not, you, you need years of practice, right? But uh, I'm talking about informing people what is machine learning because in current society, only a few, like a tiny little percentage of people actually know what machine learning is. And on the other side, we know that machine learning is all around us and all the big and small companies are using that. So Orange is really about democratization of data science. Can we... Can we support just about everybody with tools that they can use uh, to play with the data? And there's also the case where you have people who are working in the area professionally, but they don't necessarily want to break out the big guns to work through just a you know proof of concept. They just want to be able to throw some data up, you know, run it through a few different steps and see what the outcome is. And it seems that Orange is a good way to facilitate that experimentation and data exploration without having to invest a lot of upfront in terms of setting up the boilerplate for being able to load the data, process it through different steps, and then export that through a visualization tool. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like uh, smoothing the learning curve, right? I mean, think about Excel, how, how people accept this uh, as a tool that virtually any, anyone can use. And Excel is now used in uh, primary schools and secondary schools, and everybody knows about it, right? Uh, and we, we probably do not have such a tool for machine learning, right? Where I think uh, Orange and similar products are actually just ripe, right? To go to primary school and uh, think about uh, what data science is. And also, as you said, if you, even if you know how to handle big guns and you just want to pick in your, take a peek at, uh, at your data before you start using big guns, you can just open Orange and take a look. So it's really useful for, for this too. And there is also this element of interaction, right? So, so you cannot do data interaction with uh, Matplotlib or Python, right? It's this element where, where you talk with a, say, with a customer or with a colleague or with a data owner, it becomes so much fun to actually be able to touch the data. What are some of the most interesting or innovative uses of Orange that you've seen? So we are working with a group of um, physicists and chemists who um, run some large synchrotrons. These are like huge microscopes, essentially. They use radiation that comes from accelerators. And uh, one of those groups, they took Orange, threw all widgets away, and um, composed this, a new set of widgets that they use for simulating um, uh, optics that happens in these huge microscopes that they use. Um, so data there are not um, data from like machine learning, from data mining, uh, data there. So each data point is a photon, and they're trying to simulate what lenses would do with a beam of photons in the in the accelerators. 
So this is so Jana's just mentioned an example where orange is was not used as intended, right? It was uh, it's not a data is not was not a data science uh, workflow tool, but for something else, right? Yeah, they, they took the infrastructure that they have. That is um, the the canvas, the, the the part of orange that allows you to put widgets and uh, onto the schema and connect them. They took this part, but they replaced everything else. There are also other projects that used uh, orange in a more more common way. So I'm just uh, I'm just looking here. The textable uh, textable I/O is like a, is an add-on for text analysis and for digital humanities. So. There's a group of people developing their own widgets. Uh, uh, they interact with our widgets, but they also are more towards uh, text analysis. Uh, and maybe an anecdote, which is not exactly uh, so on on production of widgets, but on the use, right? So I remember I was uh, explaining uh, uh, image analysis uh, to uh, my colleague in Houston, Gatsholsky, that uh, has some he had some images for molecular biologies. And so the, the test there was classification of uh, different uh, development stages of a certain amoeba. And then, so then, uh, so, so then we quit the conversation and uh, I don't know, after eight hours, Gadi calls me back. He says, well, you know, I just went home uh, and I took the photos from my family photo album and I clustered them, right? And then he described how in, there are some images where he appears with his wife and with his children and in the mountains and without. And it was a, such a great experience, right? So, so going from just showing somebody how to do image analysis, right? Eight hours later, right, he does mining of his photo album. Yeah, it's definitely cool seeing the different ways that people will use the tools and technologies that we produce, often in ways that we don't necessarily expect. And one of the other things that is worth noting about Orange that I don't think we talked about yet is the fact that it has some widgets built in for being able to serve as data sources so that if you don't already have an existing data set that you want to work with, but you want to experiment with some of these different techniques, you have the ability to just plug into an existing stream of data. So for instance, Twitter or some of the other capabilities that you have for bringing data into the tool for doing some different types of analyses. Yeah, lately this is actually where where we are going, right? So, so we are also working with some companies uh, uh, that uh, have completely different, uh, you know, uh, environments and some uh, databases that uh, uh, where you build a widget actually to to actually access the data, and then you build some widgets to uh, visualize them in the in their own way, right? There, there are widgets. Uh, um, like uh, for PubMed browsing, and there are widgets for uh, that can gather tweets, and there are widgets that can uh, gather Facebook contacts, and so on. Right? There is such a wealth uh, of things that uh, you can still do. So, of course, we as a, I mean, we as a group, right? We wouldn't like to do everything, and we would just like to set uh, the environment where people can do that, and then enjoy on everything else, right? So, if you build a widget that can uh, I don't know, read all the Shakespeare books. Of course, there are widgets then that can cluster the text, that can analyze them, that can visualize the differences and so on. So you have this data, you have this component-rich environment where just adding one more widget enables uh, the use of Orange in completely some, some new field, right? Uh, being, um, I mean, that being, uh, I don't know, economics or digital humanities or, or physics or uh, molecular biology, whatever. So what are some of the other projects or technologies that you consider to be either competition with Orange or alternative uh, options for people who are interested in the capabilities that Orange has? Uh, so maybe first, rather than competition, we of course gain a lot from everything that is developed in Python, right? So because Orange is based on Python, whatever libraries that are new, uh, whatever deep learning that uh, uh, that comes out there, it's great for Orange because we can include it or or we learn from that. Uh, there are also similar projects in other languages, like probably most notable currently are RapidMiner and Nime. Uh, I should say that both of these are actually companies. Uh, so we are not. We are still uh, we are still a group at uh, university, right? Uh, um, and um, but but I wouldn't say that they are a competition. They're they're doing something different. So so let's say Rapid Miner 
um, is more on building the workflows that can run on servers, right? And then you get after after you you design the data, then there is a final report, right? And Orange is not about that. Orange is not about creating a report with a known workflow. Rather, uh, we what we really specialize in is like data visualization and interaction, right? So you basically work work with the data like you would tell a story, right? You start, you visualize the data, you select why you tell why this is interesting, you mine further. Um, so origin is different in that respect. And I think NIME is somewhere in between rapid minor and, and orange in, in the focus, right? Uh, so but we what we we really especially like about orange is this interactivity. And that takes a lot of development work. So so the widget that uh, shows just uh, a scatter plot, right? It would be very simple to do, right? But the widget where you can select different things in scatter plot, and then you have all the modifier keys that uh, you can not only select one group, but you, then you can define clusters uh, and that outputs this kind of cluster that you can analyze further. That's much more work, right? Even for a simple thing like uh, scatter plot, but then consider dendrograms, trees, graphs, networks, all of them have to be interactive, and this is the speciality where uh, I think where we have a niche. And under what circumstances would you advise against using Orange? If your focus is not data visualization and interaction, then then maybe. So if you would like to have a really good prediction accuracy and um, when you have large data sets that don't fit into memory, you like you'd like to use. Um, I don't know, cloud computing, then you cannot use Orange for that. So if you're just into making uh, lots of predictions quickly, that's not Orange. Orange is about, as Blash said, it's it's a storytelling tool. You let the data tell a story. Um, it, so in, in this case, you would use Orange. If you, just, if you just like to squeeze your data, then it's not Orange. And you've mentioned a lot of the different types of widgets that you have currently. I'm wondering what are some of the ones that you would like to see in future versions or ones that you would like to see contributed as additional plugins for Orange? We are now working uh, in some specialized fields, like uh, we are building Orange for single cell genomics. Since single cell genomics is like the, the almost like a brand new field that it's just Popping, popping up and the, the data there is very interesting and needs uh, integration with uh, other libraries in molecular genomics. So this is a part of uh, what our group is working on. We are, of course, working on uh, towards some new uh, data visualizations widget. And we would also like to uh, find means of how to explain the results of deep learning. So, so widgets that use deep learning, but they that have the explanation power, right? If I, if I say that, uh, I don't know, there's a, there's an image, right? And, and on that image, there's, a, I don't know, uh, it, it's an image from, let's say, uh, clinical medicine, and there's a certain disease in that image. I would like to point out what particular part of image uh, is responsible for that, and I would like to do that interactively so, so that uh, I can explore further uh, what's happening. So, but beyond widgets, right, uh, I think, uh, what we're working on is now we would like to create dashboards. So Orange is uh, in Orange you visually design the workflows, but then you would like to select some of the uh, typical visualizations uh, uh, and maybe settings of particular methods like clustering, right? And you would like to organize them in the dashboard with a constraint that the dashboard should be just as interactive as everything else uh, is in, in is in Orange. And so we are, I think it's going to take us a, a few more months uh, to turn Orange into a dashboard creator. Uh, yeah, and the widgets I'm interested in are education. So we have an education add-on with widgets uh, intended, intended to teach about data mining. We use it in lectures, in, in uh, hands-on courses we give. I'd really like to ex expand this part because I think we can be really good at this. Uh, there are just a few widgets there. And the other part is Internet of Things. So I'm playing with uh, microcontrollers and we are, we, I don't think we have any widgets that can pull data from there. But this would be really interesting if uh, if we can um, add widgets for analyzing 
data that comes continuously from small microcontrollers that you put around with sensors, um, stuff like this. Uh, we are wor also working on widgets that use deep learning. Uh, so the idea is not to use Orange for deep learning because usually deep learning takes a lot of data and time. You don't do that in Orange. But once you build a model, you can use something called uh, transfer learning, right? So you can, um, let's say, you can learn embedders from millions of images, but then you only have a small set of images that you would like to analyze. And this is what we would like uh, Orange to do. We would uh, we would allow people to read these images and then put them through embedders uh, and then analyze them and probably explain what is on each image. So something like uh, the analysis for smaller data sets, but using uh, already trained uh, deep models and deep models for images and text and uh, graph structures uh, and also, for instance, chemical structures. And beyond just the widgets, what are some of the other features that you have planned for future releases? So as I said, dashboards. So dashboard is where we're going we gonna to go this, next. And is there any particular help or certain areas that you would like um, contributions from people who are using Orange and you'd like to have some feedback or contributions in terms of code or documentation or other types of input? Um, I think Python community is doing great. So so many things are developed there that anything you want, somebody is working on it. So we are really happy with our choice of language. And um, I, I don't think we, we, we could have any specific wishes that are not being fulfilled right now already. There's also help coming from community. So every time somebody installs Orange, there's a, there's a, so Orange is, comes for free. You don't need to leave email, but you can actually answer survey questions. And we're learning a lot from people that uh, enter this survey. So there are now two. One is a short one that you can answer in one minute. And one is a longer one where people actually can put some thoughts into and it's great to, to see that every week, right? We have somebody in the lab that summarizes all the, all the surveys and it's great to look at that and what people would like to have. Of course, we are just like a small group of uh, about 10 to 20 developers. We cannot fulfill everything. Uh, and uh, currently we are uh, contacted uh, by a number of companies that actually would like to extend Orange in particular ways, let's say for healthcare or uh, for... Uh, um, financial markets or for and and this is great because uh, it's gonna actually propel orange through through domains that w we as a as a single group right we cannot address uh, because of the lack of domain knowledge and of course lack of time but essentially what we are doing is building a tool that uh, the others can either use or can develop their own widgets for their own liking are there any other topics that we didn't cover yet that you think we should talk about before we start to close out the show? In the past year, I've been enjoying also working with uh, Ida Pretner. Uh, uh, she's um, uh, she's actually an anthropologist. In, I mean, she's not a computer scientist. She's an anthropologist, joined my lab about two years ago, and the plan was actually to make YouTube videos um, uh, that relate to Orange and uh, that introduced uh, anybody to data science. And this has been great fun. And um, so the, the, the videos are picked up. I think uh, there have been almost half a million views already. The videos are short, about three minutes each. Uh, and we keep adding them like uh, in the rate of one per month. And that has been great. Uh, also, it helps uh, the group sometimes to focus on something that is new that we would like to present in Orange. And then we kind of polish this up. So it's like an artificial deadline for, uh, for the group as well. And one last question is, where does the name come from? It's always, we always get this question at some stage. <laughs> Uh, so the initial name that uh, when we were conceiving the machine learning library uh, uh, with Yanis was ML star, like a closure on machine learning, right? So any number of components that you would combine, right? And this is very hard. Uh, so what, what is that? ML star, right? Should be, how do you write this, right? Should be MLS or something. Uh, and then I went... Uh, to my wife and ask, well, we have this funny name, which, which is very geekish, right? I mean, now that I think back, maybe we should keep with that one. But uh, um, uh, but then she said, okay, how about blue? And I said, no, blue is melancholic, right? And then say, she said, let's call it orange. Uh, 
(laughs) (laughs) And looking deeper into that a little bit, it seems like it's a little bit serendipitous because a lot of the work that you're doing with machine learning is comparisons, and sometimes you're trying to compare apples and oranges. So it has another layer there too. Yeah, so this, of course, it's, uh, I mean... When you choose a name, I think uh, the rule is never to choose a name from any color of fruit, right? Um, <laughs> and we picked <laughs> we picked both, which is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were I don't know. I think five years uh, we gathered uh, twenty of us together, and we say, okay, maybe we should change it. Uh, and then we talked for a, we discussed this for a week, right? What are all the derivatives or orange that we could use? Uh, and. Uh, I think now it's so, I mean, there are so many pages, so many web pages and so many references to orange data mining that uh, we probably cannot go and change it anymore. So it's going to stay like this for uh, for future. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to follow the work that either of you are up to and keep in touch, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I'll move us into the picks. And for my pick this week, I'm going to choose an episode of the Data Stories podcast, where they spoke to a couple of people from the New York Times Learning Lab about a project that they're working on called What's Going On in This Graph, where they take different Uh, data visualizations and graphs from past episodes of the New York Times, strip out a lot of the context, and then post it on the the learning network so that students and teachers can try to ask and answer some questions about what the purpose of the graph is, what's the context around it, and then after about a week or so, they will also post the actual story that it was originally embedded into, and they have moderators facilitating the discussions, so it seems like a really interesting project and uh, something that it looks like it would be a lot of fun for students and educators to get involved with. And so with that, I'll pass it to you, Blaj. Do you have any picks for us this week? Yeah, I actually enjoy uh, the podcast by NPR, How I Build This, uh, with uh, Guy Ross. Um, so I cannot name a particular one, but uh, every one that I listen to uh, was great so uh, i really like that it gives me uh, it gives me energy i listen it listen to it usually when i'm in the car after work uh, and it's simply it's great to resetting my mind and uh, listen how other people have uh, struggled and uh, quite a number of them succeeded and yanez do you have any picks for us yeah it's an advent of code it's something that happens every december you get a new new thing to program every day it's a can take you five minutes, can take you five hours if you're if the problem is more difficult. Usually it's just like a few minutes. Uh, but it's a nice task. I use it for I use those tasks also for students. And you can set your own challenges. So you can do it. One colleague did it. So you get 25 tasks. He decided to do it in 25 different languages. Uh, last year, I decided to do everything on Arduino, which is a small microcontroller with uh, two kilobytes of memory. This year, I'm deciding to. I decided to learn a new language, so I'm doing it in Kotlin, which is really nice language. I shouldn't say that here, but um, sometimes some programs in Kotlin are even nicer than in Python. So advent of code is my pick. All right. Well, I appreciate the both of you taking time out of your days to talk to me about the work you're doing with Orange. Uh, It's definitely a very interesting tool and one that I'm likely to start experimenting with and possibly even use to start teaching my children about data literacy and data science. So thank you for that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your days. Okay. Thanks a lot for inviting us. It's been great. So I I have to admit, I didn't know about your podcast uh, until you invited us, but I listened to about 20 of of them already and they're all great. So you're doing great work. So thank you a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.